Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're proud to have Rick Griffith here at the CVA tonight. And we met last fall to discuss the exhibition you see behind you, the mural works. We're so glad that he's um, going to share his practice with you. Uh, I will read a land acknowledgement for all of you before we start. Uh, the Center for Visual Art acknowledges the privilege we have to gather in this place. Once the territories and homelands of so many indigenous peoples, including the Arapaho and Cheyenne nations, we respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land and value the knowledge systems that they have developed in relationship to this land. We acknowledge the offering, a we understand that offering a land acknowledgement either absolves settler colonialism privilege nor diminishes colonial structures of violence at an individual or institutional level. Land acknowledgements must be accompanied with ongoing commitments to indigenous and immigrant communities. To learn more about the spatial relationships of indigenous communities to this land, we recommend visiting native-land.ca and exploring the interactive map. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Rick. Sometimes land acknowledgements are bad. Well, actually, just, you know, I do about um, 35 to 40 speaking engagements a year, and sometimes land acknowledgements don't exist. Sometimes they're terrible. Sometimes they're good, like the one you just heard, which I like the does not absolve part. And sometimes when they're not said, I simply stand up and say, it's so important to acknowledge the attempted and continued genocide of the First Nations people of this continent, right? And that's it. Like, attempted and continued genocide, that about covers it. If you want the, the juice of it, like what we should be concerned with and how we should be framing the concept of the settler colonialism that happened here and the agreements that were not kept here. That's my version. I read once that land acknowledgements can feel kind of hollow, but they mean the most when they're in your own words and you feel them and you know them. So I don't rehearse it. I just try and remember the names of the tribes wherever I am in the country. And then I just speak from my heart and try and breathe through some of that. So that's what I did. I just gave you my little bit of it. Um, hi, my name is Rick. Thank you so much for coming out. You'll understand later why I do that, why I talk about that, why I express things that way. Um, and hopefully, you know, I make that clear. Like I, I clarify my position and who I am and who we can be together. Is the sound okay for the people online? Are they, are they giving you negative feedback? They telling you Rick is already canceled and banned. Oh, okay, fine. All right, so let's move ahead. This up? Sure. I can just pick it up. No, that's no, don't pick it up. Don't touch it, Rick. Don't even look at it. It goes to eleven. Don't look at it. No. Okay. Sorry. Don't change. Okay. Here we go. Uh, hello, my name is Rick Griffith, and my mother's maiden name is Macmillan. And the uh, yeah. please turn your phasers to stun. Um, my mother's maiden name is Macmillan, and the birthplace of my maternal grandmother is Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago in the British West Indies. This is me at 16 years old in Fairfax County, Virginia. And the reason why I share this is probably twofold. One is to say that whatever part of me that you encounter that feels uh, fucking punk rock is and non-compliant is and has been since 16. Um, and I just, you know, like I didn't just grow this. Uh, actually, so that I just grew this. But, <laughs> but, um, but I've been this way for a minute and it's well rehearsed in my heart and my brain who I am. 
This is the album cover that changed my life. And I was uh, working at a record store and uh, it doubled as a head shop. For those of you guys who sort of remember head shots, head, head, head shops, it's kind of like a vape store. Having a vape store and a uh, record store in one place, that's where I worked. And my boss brought this record in and said, you gotta hear this record. I was like, sure. And while I was looking at it, Hold on. While I was looking at it, I also uh, discovered that it, it was so good looking and so interesting that I was like, well, what if, can I just play it through this? That's great. Here you go. So um, this is this, this is the music. And I was like, this album is actually super good looking and super interesting. And the typography at the top was what I was super excited by, because this is all very much pre Photoshop. This is 1984 in Fairfax County. Um, and so I just got excited. The music was weird and raucous and interesting. And the album was cool. And I said, I don't know what they call people that made album covers for a living, but I'm kind of sure I want to be that. So when I decided to be that, my journey as a graphic designer began. And this is the first book that I found in the basement of the Strand Bookstore in New York City uh, that was starting to teach me graphic design. The gentle gentleman's name is Georgi Kepish, and he's a Hungarian uh, immigrant to the United States in the 1950s. It's a classic text, difficult to find, out of print, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, if you want to score uh, one of these, one of the things I don't talk about in, in the lecture today is that I own a bookstore. It's on 21st and Market. It loves graphic design. And if you love graphic design, it loves you. Oh, and also it loves black intellectuals, queer intellectuals, female intellectuals. And, uh, and if you're one of those people that like to read the products of those intellectuals, it also loves you. I learned, though, that am I going to turn myself away from love because it's not coming in the color? Um, that or the form that I think it should come, that's the saboteur, that's the sab sabotage that keeps us in pain. Rather than saying, you know, I'm gonna have to go where the love is. And where the love is, is the hope of community. That's why I tell people they get to know it. I said, I take my community where I find it. So that's the late Bell Hooks. And she's talking about the fact that like, you know, color, skin color, it's all very inconvenient, you know, like, would you love me more if I were white? Would I love you more if you were black? I mean, we're programmed in certain ways. It's all very fucking inconvenient because love is what love is. And if you can transcend the concepts that keep us apart, right, that create divisions between us, then we can actually figure out how to be together in whatever form of love that makes sense. I'm making prolonged eye contact with you. I know that. I love you. Thank you. We clicked away from our sharing. I'm sorry. Can we escape one more time? I'm annoying. Teams is annoying. Yeah, <laughs> you're feeling. What do I need to play? So just the share button, the up button. Yeah. And then you're switching you back into your wherever, which one? That one. Thank okay. you. Sorry. Uh, presenting, give control or stop presenting? Give control. Give control. That one's fine. I should be seeing it. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, Microsoft. <laughs> if it wasn't like a small mom pop tech company, I would be like, no problem. It's just Microsoft. Um, but since it's not, then it's like, ugh, Microsoft, what do I not love? <laughs> the most important part of this is to read this carefully, right? The, what appears to be the operative word is my. And the idea that that operative word is my makes it true for every single person in the room and beyond. Because you can say it to me and I can say it to you and it would still be true. And the reason why we explore that truth is because the fear that is inside of us is kind of based on this notion of violence. And there are many forms of violence, right? But 
the the instinct that I have around why we are not connected as people is because of this fear. And so fear is really the operative word, not my. My is what makes it truth, but fear is the operative word because that's what keeps us apart. And if you skip every line, it just says people invented violence. It's like a sampling of my work, like maybe over the last five or six years, Give you some insight into what I've made. Lights down a little bit would be amazing. I feel about to beat them, if they won't go get back for the weekend. On a spread, I'll stay away from the train. I'm going to take a kid, take another train. For the next guy, watch the ball, we don't be wide. Three times, one time for the mind. Four times, three times for the soul. That's how we go when we go. Holy Ghost, come and take control. Say, it's our heart, so we do us. Everlasting, we will be. Say, it's our heart, so we do us. Everlasting, we will be. Say, it's our heart, so we do us. Everlasting, we will be. Say, it's our heart, so we do us. I don't know if it takes before from 19, how long I've been dead before. Baptized or not in the book of the Lord. Clean and lean like the foot of the Lord. I don't move with the ticket. You say them seeds for the most tickle it. Got no style in the book, no clouds in the book. Open like the number of rise. Some of the eye. Oh, hey, double the eye. One move, yeah. Sing, yeah. Pull him, yeah. Push, 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 right. Not looking up the guard. The right thing. Why not try to clock it? Who that poor brain? Who that five thing? Big stick, push in the brain. So what you think? Big stick, push in the brain. So what you think? Big stick, who that? Say, yeah. So we dream. Double the eye. Think double the eye. Say, yeah. So we dream. Double the eye. Double the eye. Think double the eye. Push the sound now, push the now now, get me, get up, we're gonna get down now, move profound now, round profound now, spend my pound now, now I'm on bro. I need to be some give me some sustenance, gonna get away from here. sort of goes a long way to decide whether or not you should listen to me or not, whether I'm any good at what I do or not, and that's fine. Here's another thing. The other dimension about my work is that I love thinking about design and making things about design. And so uh, getting visually bored with something or saying like, ah, I've made enough stuff, but I want to think some more or, you know, just like moving between the spaces of making and thinking and then thinking about making and then making about thinking. That's actually my practice. So uh, in my 20s, I offered a definition of graphic design, which I made into scarves and pillowcases and t-shirts, and eventually onto a piece of paper. Also went through and did a graffiti project, meaning I installed, uh, I got the intern to cut out a four by eight stencil, attempted to install it in the street, 
got caught by the cops. Um, and this was our team at the time, Jeremy and Addy and myself. Um, got caught by the cops. The cops were like, what the hell is this? And we're like, ah, oh, it's the definition of graphic design. And they're like, and you want to tell people about it? And I was like, desperately, sir, desperately. And they're like, get the fuck out of here. Um, and so, so, and the reason why it's in two colors must be obvious by now. We got caught at the red and then I had to go back out and finish it. So that's, I couldn't find the red spray can. I must have tossed it somewhere and just like to run away. This is the annotated version of it, which goes a long way to say that I don't always trust myself, which is a common feature in human beings, I hear. And the notion that I didn't trust myself was that also I had to go back and annotate this text and make it mean, like when I wrote that slide that just said what I mean generally, what I said generally followed by what I mean, is that whole idea of not trusting people understanding what the hell I'm talking about, which is no less true right now, just so that you know where my head's at. There's sometimes exhibitions about my work, which is lovely, and I make collages now as my creative practice. It's kind of a constant creative practice. I make diagrams about things that I like to think about. In this case, I'm thinking about thought, which is just like designing about design, right? I mean, who knows? It's, it's, people call that meta. I just call that inside my own head, right? That's all. It's very convenient. This is about opportunities for like queer and BIPOC people and how it looks like an inverse funnel where only one of us can be any good at anything at any given time. And it's really frustrating because there's a lot of us who are trying to share our talents with the world. And this fucking inverse funnel is very frustrating. By the way, you know, like not for nothing, like institutions like this, sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not. But it's the place where you should have conversations about this kind of funnel, this shape, this idea that women or queer people or black people or whatever in positions of leadership and authority only get to ascend in a sort of a trickle state or a single sort of single file line. And that's what this funnel is about. You should be able to have those conversations with people about it. But of course you can't, because if you do have the conversation, it comes out unsatisfactorily, then what happens is it becomes a hostile work environment because you've been denied something that you're actually entitled to, which is an opportunity. And therefore that's why we don't fucking talk about it. Moving on. So uh, what design might be? I'm so sprinting here. Is it okay? Okay. Like if it wasn't, what would you say? Meh. This is really my definition of design. It's pretty cool. It's actually an action. It's a method. That's it. It's, it's how we get to the stuff part. And we use time and talent to do it. And sometimes objectivity is really important. That's why we call it invention, because it's never been thought of and we never thought of it until we did. And then we made something happen about it. And then sometimes a connection to the challenge or the problem or the, the situation is really useful too. And we call that over time expertise. So it's also the same for global markets. Things that used to be called the World Organization on Trade and Tariff turned into a three-letter acronym, which we all kind of know, maybe some of us don't. It's called the WTO, which also controls trade and tariff, but it also controls trade and tariff through various new mechanisms like the financialization of interest on loans that are given by world banks. Meh, meh, meh. Not very interesting. The point is, is that they have alignment, they have opportunity, they have authority. And the thing that's making this a real thing is called the global growth imperative. You should know that. There's a global imperative to grow everything all the fucking time. And we're a part of it. You wonder why, like, the world is fucked up? It's because of this growing things. Everything's got to be bigger all the time. It's not because people are terrible, but they sometimes are. It's because of this one word growth and the imperative is the agreement that it needs to happen. So what happens? You privatize prisons then you have not prisons full of black people and poor people. And guess what? Through opportunity, alignment, authority and the growth imperative, that's what you end up having is policy design. Right. So design is an instrument or an action that allows or makes things happen out of the instinct or opportunity or alignment or the authority of all sorts of people in charge of stuff, which is why it's nice not to be in charge of stuff. Though I'm in charge of enough stuff, but I'm really like, I'm in, I'm, I'm, I'm the people, I'm little people. I swear to God, I'm little people. I know I'm up here right now, but I'm little people, trust me. 
And this is the problem. Most of the time we're talking about vulnerable people are the opportunity. So if you're an undecided voter, guess what you get? You get all the information from both sides, from Fox and from MSNBC or whoever else is trying to recruit you, and you get all the information. If you're a decided voter, you're not, right? You're gonna get more stuff just convincing you to show up and do the thing. Vulnerable people, poor people, vulnerable people, people who have actively got legislation against them, queer people, black people, et cetera, vulnerable people make it all happen. This is basically the bias. That's it, it's a bias against vulnerable people. If you go back to Martin Luther King's speeches, he doesn't just talk about the circumstances for black people, he actually talks more about the circumstances of poor people. Because he knew well back then that this was a war on the poor, not a war on just black people. That poor white people would be a perfectly good uh, sacrifice to make in every area, education and otherwise, would be a perfectly good sacrifice to make as long as black people didn't get educated. So it's really against poor people. It's a lot to take in. When I'm writing or making notes or trying to understand things, I do it with type, I do it with words and I draw the words and sometimes I slow myself down like I draw the words with a brush or I draw the words with a combination of tools. But I'm always trying to create understandings, hierarchies or bad word, prioritizations, but I'm always trying to create a relationship from one word to the next or one idea to the next, et cetera, until it turns into something like this. This happens to be the curricula that I taught myself graphic design with, and it's got all sorts of juicy bits in it, for sure. Things like, you know, rhetoric, dialectics, grammar, oratory, logic, and debate regarding religious texts and communication history. Like, what are we supposed to study if we're going to understand how we all talk to each other? What's the best place to do it in our mythologies, like religious texts, right? Because they inform so much of our ideas. It's good to have multiple ideas. So I usually tell people, I get in trouble for telling people this too, but I usually tell people that you can't be a good atheist unless you've read at least two totally different religious texts. Um, and that is, and you can't be a good anything unless you understand other people's position in this conversation about mythologies and religions and stuff like that. So there, uh, all sorts of diagrams for all sorts of reasons, including this piece that the Denver Art Museum, um, what's the word I'm looking for, commissioned and exhibited in 2014. I just do this all the time. It's how I make things make sense. Like things, writing them in straight lines, on lines, that doesn't make sense to me. Creating relationships to things, drawing arrows and connecting the ideas, that makes sense to me. Also makes it more memorable for me. So I worked with words, like as many words as possible, generally speaking, all the words. That's just where I am. Deep breath, mental models matter. If I tell you that gravity is in play, you expect something to fall down. If words are falling down, I tell you about gravity, it means that the mental model of something is that it's falling, right? And that mental model of something falling or descending or moving, or even just being, you know, like sort of politely pushed off a cliff, like so. This mental model transcends so many different things to be a story. It's a story about gravity. Now, when you say I'm falling down, it's me, it's a person, and you're falling down, and it's gravity is the, like, the key part of the story. Mental models matter. And we only have a few mental models to work with. The physical world provides a number of them for us, but we need to create more between ourselves. And we need to shape complexity into meaning without reducing it into simple nonsense. Right? It's, simplicity isn't the answer. Accepting complexity is the answer. And trying to go as far into it as you can is the answer. Using the intellect you have, the, the puzzle-solving machine called a brain that you have. Using that to go into whatever complexity you can discover. So I discovered some things going on in the design field and I decided to start working on it. The culture of our design studio started with a simple idea. It started in 1999, started with this idea. Very simple, very snarky, very rude, very silly. 
And also it just identified how petty designers really are, right? So you give that to another designer, they're like, they're like, they wish they thought of it first is really what they're saying. And that's what makes us petty. It's snarky, it's funny, it's cute. However, this is what happened. Life events changed me. I decided to put down sarcasm and cynicism, and I divorced myself from them forever. And I also divorced them from the workplace. So by 2003, well, 2006 or seven, this was the policy in the studio. And we started writing things about our culture in the studio that were really different, right? They had a lot more of an aspirational tone to them. We talked about the things we made and how well we made them. We tried to design things that spoke to our expertise. The bigger dot is the thing we do more often. And we eventually came up with this, nine things. It's cute, it's also awesome. It's never been wrong. That's what I love about it. Because even when it moved on to being something else like this, it's still not wrong. It's just part of this. And when this, because you know I don't trust myself, I'm thinking that like I didn't work hard enough, I'm, I'm whatever. I turned it into this, which is the introductory ethic for designers and other thinking persons. And then this became the real thesis. This is what I discovered about design. It's not what design is, it's what good design is. If someone's being critical about design, what are the ways that we measure it? This is one of the fundamental ways that I measure good design. No fucking victims, that's that. So again, I had to modify it. I went to Portugal. I played with it for a while. I drew shapes. I did a number of different things. I redesigned it and renamed it to an introductory ethic for designers and other thinking persons. But really it's an introductory ethic for designers to collaborate with other thinking persons who have their own expertise, imaginations, credentials, and concerns. So instead of centering the designer as the hero, unnecessary, everyone's a designer when you give them a chance to be, and everyone has expertise, imagination, a credential of some kind and a concern. And so this is what it now is. And to zoom in very quickly, some of the things here like say no when it makes sense, no and no thank you, be polite of course, work only for the trustworthy, why is that? Because providing the untrustworthy with your labor promotes their bad action and gives them more power, facts. I mean, I could tell you why not to spend money in a certain place because they're bad people, blah, 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 blah. And you know that already. I'm not telling you something you don't already know, generally speaking. By the way, you line. <laughs> Horrible. And working for people who are untrustworthy is super bad. You are more than likely working against your own best interest or the best interest of someone you love. Facts. Let's move on. Anyway, all of this is available in that bookstore I talked about. These are in drawers. These are pay what you can afford. Don't worry about it. It's all fun. Re-evolutionary forms. This is the printing bit. Cool for the printing bit? Go for the printing bit? Printing bit. Yeah, sure. So here we go. Um, when the pandemic happened, I got a show at MCA. They gave me a pile of money to make the work for the show. It's, oops, sorry. Um, when they gave me the money for the show in community with other letterpress printers around the country, I found out that my friends Kim um, and Rob in Muncie, Indiana were completely out of business because their print shop only did fairs and carnivals. And so they were just screwed. I said, what if I take the money from the show and come to you and use your print shop for a couple of weeks, make the work for the show and just rent you, your staff and the, sh and the space um, so that you guys have some income to buy at least beers or whatever, you know, pandemic beers. Um, so I, I went there and they have this enormous wall full of type and it's amazing. But when I showed up, I realized I hated that typeface. It's one typeface called Poster Gothic. And I knew I hated Poster Gothic before I got there. I just didn't know that's their big investment was Poster Gothic. I set out tables and tables of text that I was going to, you know, that I had already written, that I was going to print. And I realized that I was not going to do any of that work. I have to shift gears really fast. So what I did find was a bunch of junky plates like these. These are magnesium plates that photo plates that were used for like 
all sorts of rubbish back in the day, like the 70s and the 60s, just photo plates of people in bands for honky tonk posters or whatever. And I took them on, they're all trash, they're on this box. And, uh, and I started cutting them up into forms and shapes. And we came, I invented for my own self a brand new way of thinking about tone and images and color and all sorts of stuff. And so um, this was a magnificent moment for me because like if I work really hard at what I do, I find something new every four years or so. And this was the thing that I found. Yes, that was 2020. So hey, what will 24 have? And this is the work that showed up. This is the stuff that started showing up as a result of that. And I'm super happy about how it turned out. And you know what it really means in the world of printing, because no one else, I mean, I, this is in Italy right now. Like um, this went to three countries. Other people got to work with these forms and shapes. I got to work, this is Switzerland. This is me like doing the next level of stuff with it. I took it around the world and worked collaboratively with other people with these forms and shapes. And it was really, really successful for me. And so what I like about this is that I basically surrendered to the process of inventing or finding a way to work with whatever materials were hanging around. I fortunately found some trash, which meant that I didn't have to make something new, which is great. And then I started just ruminating and being really um, inventive with it. And I didn't stop. This is, uh, this is great. I mean, I still enjoy working with it. And these are the forms. That's my friend Duffy, whose studio I'm in right now. And then this is me printing stuff, right? So it's, it's hard to, to say what kind of joy I got out of it, but this ended up making an alphabet. Um, of course, I love type and, and words. So these forms end up taking on brand new shapes and stuff. And this is really uh, the story of it, but re-evolutionary forms, meaning things that just kind of re-evolved or evolved again. And this is the tagline for it, so to speak. Re-evolutionary re modularity is a matter of interoperability. It's also a strategy for collabor collaboration and optimism. Born out of trash, yeah? And just so a little insight into how I build these collaborative forms. There's all sorts of monkeying around going on here. It's really quite difficult in some ways, um, you know? And if this is all you have to do to make one thing, like imagine making tons of these things. So, and when I say you, I mean me. Bonus project. Anyone ready for a bonus project? Let's go. This right here was on the press, and this is what I started working on. Does that shape look familiar to anyone? That's a bonita. So I was part of a crew that was out there saving Casa Bonita. We were the first crew to do it. We got out in the street. We wore costumes. I'm with Andrew Novick, who, if you don't know him, he's a delightful human being, wonderful person. And when I got home and we were just doing this, you know, sort of quasi-activist work in the middle of Colfax Avenue, <laughs> um, I thought, why don't I make a poster for um, Casa Bonita out of these shapes and forms because it's kind of an interesting, iconic shape. So this is the poster. So I'll show it to you. And this is me like setting it up in the press. Takes forever. So I won't bore you with that because we're sprinting. Anyway, in case that's the sketch, that's the color, that's the work, that's the combination. Boom, save Casa Bonita, moving on. Inquirer Collection, another printing project you should know about. This is huge. It's a gigantic, like, think of this space, but times about eight. It's in Two Rivers, uh, Wisconsin, and it's full of wood block plates from two centuries ago and one century ago and maybe 75 years ago. And there's circus things. There's all sorts of nonsense. I was given a fellowship slash um, residency to explore a simple concept of ableism amongst these prints. And so what I did was I did research with my daughter here, Marin, who is graduating from college this semester. <laughs> and, uh, and we basically printed our hearts out for two weeks straight, um, coming up with some interesting ideas. 
um, really working hard together, just making meaning out of the things that we encountered. And we started writing with the catchphrases that we found and started working on stuff. This is what we, this is what we did at first as a warm up exercise. Free restrictions may apply, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, this boxer was cool, you know, like we encountered so many different shapes of people from these historic images. And then we did this as another warm up about capitalism. And then a third warm up was this collage I did with a bunch of the uh, images that we printed of words, of course, and then cutting them up and then compiling them again. And I made a one page zine for the zine project called Out of Context. And it was a bunch of words that were out of context from those posters. This is the three of us in our Berserkers t-shirts or uh, Berserkers is a bar in that neck of the woods. And then this is the finished product. So I encountered five or six different really key images and one of them, this is a good one to talk about. This is, you know, uh, Miss Bertha Curtis. And uh, she was uh, presented as the, the fat lady. Now, for me, the idea of like, I don't know whether or not someone was exploited or whether this was a safe haven. But either way, for me, the psychology of this is really deep in the sense of this is about their body they're being presented and money's being made like by creating a freak show or an oddity show out of it and i wanted to sort of figure out how to reverse that idea and so i printed these not with the same faithful colors they were printed in before but i printed them with some fresh looks on them and with the word look in the background that's why you see the double o over her right there and the double O is in both of these prints. That's the man with no stomach. I mean, obviously it's really interesting to see these next to each other. Um, and that's Jim Moran. So what I did with these was I basically um, fold on, on Ossified Harry, I folded the paper and then stitched and then cut it apart and then stitched it back together again. And that felt really good for me. And then on, so this is the stitching. And of course, when I say I, I mean my daughter did. <laughs> um, so, sorry. And then the other two, what I did was I stitched these radiating uh, halos out that were pointing to their bellies. And instead of them being sort of like oddities, what I was doing was putting the divine back into their bodies as they were being presented to people. So I was turning them into sort of gods in that sort of polytheistic framework. And so I really enjoyed doing that. And it helped create a dialogue about the history of body dysmorphia and the idea that we've been exploiting bodies for a really long time. And those are the thank yous. I make gig posters. These are two gig posters that are pretty good examples. Mark Rebier is famous for playing uh, his music in his underpants. And uh, I really liked making this poster where I could put the word ballroom on the actual room for the balls. Um, so that was really great. And then St. Vincent is a really obvious way of taking just key images and making some fantastic shapes and working with those key images that, that she is really well known in that sense. So I just wanted to show you a couple of those posters. Iterations. <laughs> Iterations and forms is the last bit. Um, thank you so much for listening and thank you for uh, being here. And uh, when I told you I do this collage practice, it's I do it uh, pretty much every day. And uh, sometimes I collect them together and I put them out in the world like this so that you can see that from time to time, it's just, it's just making things is important. What shows up in the mix is something which you can kind of come back to later. Like you don't have to appreciate everything you make. Sometimes it's like it's a hot garbage, but you get to make something else the next day. And maybe that won't be. But my joy in making collages is that I'm exploring form and I, I love inventing things, so I don't get to do it enough. This is one of those things that every time I make it, I'm interrogating it for, is this something new 
or is this something old? Have I made this before? Is it part of who I am? Or is this actually like me birthing things every day? It's complicated when you make every day. It's not, it's not always clean. It's not always healthy, but you use it as a coping mechanism in the life that you already have. And so, You're sure put to the mess. It's your healthy limits. Someone very wise said, when you make all the time, you have to be comfortable with a certain amount of waste. Just a thought. Get comfortable with your waste. This might be the most important thing I'm working on right now is how to articulate this idea. The best I can bring you to it right now is by saying this. My name is Rick Griffith. My mother's maiden name is Macmillan. The birthplace of my maternal grandmother is Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago. I come from five generations of immigrants and every single place that my family is from was colonized by the British. I was born in London. My hope for our time together is that I get to the questions for the people who have questions and that any part of anything that has been useful that you uh, get from me, that you take freely into your own work, play or otherwise. Thanks for having me. Oh. You know, we had two questions about uh, where you live. So where I live. Yeah, so oh yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you're both interested. Sure. Well, was Lyman and Yeah, you start. I'm not well. Sorry. Yeah, it was I. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Please. Hi. Oh yeah, Portugal. Yeah, I'm trying to homestead in Portugal. Sorry. So, I mentioned Portugal and Brooklyn. Right. And what was your question? So I think students come to America. Margaret Thatcher has some terrible domestic policy in the 1980s that created a uh, a fascistic uprising in London that created a number of different riots. 
and also created as a very safe place for people to inflict violence on people like me and people who are from places like me and my family. So my family fled London for America and for Fairfax County, Virginia, the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Um, and I came here when I was 15, 16 years old, like almost 16. And then my family imploded uh, and I ran away. I ran away. I ran as far as I could, got a job, got a roommate. My first roommate was a pregnant person who had been like disowned by her family. So we were a couple of swells, as we say, a couple of, couple of kids. Um, yeah, crazy life, crazy, crazy life. I always, I always try and just remind people, like, it's a miracle that we're here together, like asking questions and acknowledging each other and seeing each other, because I didn't even choose to be here, and neither did you. We had no choosing in our existence. And I traveled across continents to be here, to be with you right now. You know what I mean? That's beautiful. We should hold on to that a little bit closer, you know what I mean? Because none of us chose to be here, and yet we are here right now. It's quite delicious when you think about it. It's quite delicious. And, and, and I suppose auspicious, right, is the right word to use. And if we don't know that word, just think of it as like dreamy, awesome and dreamy, right? So does that answer your questions? Oh, and Brooklyn and Portugal, uh, I have a small print shop and a bed in, uh, uh, in Brooklyn, where I have privileges in an apartment with that guy named Jeremy who almost got arrested. Yeah, he's like one of my best friends 20 years later. And he lives in Brooklyn and he offers me the, the pullout couch in the room where Justin, our roommate, makes guitar pedals when he's not chefing because he's a professional chef. So I have some privileges in an apartment in Brooklyn and I put a print shop in the basement of that apartment. So when I go there, it looks a lot like this setup. When I go there, by the way, guys, do you want to ink this and go? Um, the, when I go there, it's fun. I can work, I can play, I can be in New York and I can be with my, my chosen family, my dear friends, yeah. And why Portugal? Why Portugal? Uh, the, the short answer for Portugal is that my assumption about Portugal is that it's already done all of the worst things that it has, that it'll do to the world already. And now it's a humble little South European country that doesn't want to be much else, right? But it did invent slavery. I mean, it did attempt to conquer the world as well. Um, and to whatever extent that the Jesuit order was brutal in the places that they colonized, uh, that they invented that as well. But, but um, I think that their reign of terror is long over, and so it's a safer place to be than America, which seems to be uh, re revolving back to or devolving back to the same fascist experience that my parents had in, in the UK, right? So, the hell. Oh, Denver got to be special because when I, um, when I decided with my partner um, that we were gonna have, when we decided we were gonna have children, we were like, we can't have children in Boulder. There's nothing more sad than a black child that doesn't know they're black, you know? So we had to get out of Boulder. And we basically came to Denver because we felt that the Denver community would uh, not force our kids to acculturate into something that they were not, right? And so far, so good, right? So far, so good. Um, but yeah, and, and, uh, and I stayed here because I ended up loving this place and stayed here because it felt like we could do something good here, which is why we've opened this bookstore and why we are activists in this community. Yeah, great questions. Are there any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Yeah, you. Hi. Good. Nice to see you. Hi. Yeah. Hi, you in the back. Yes. Stages. Punk rock stages. Mm. Uh, so I have two knee replacements, which explains 
the punk rock stages I dived off of uh, or dove from. That was interesting for sure. It's good. Sounds good. There's um, everyone. This is my dear friend Rafael Fajardo. He is a uh, assistant professor. No, sorry, assistant associate associate professor at the University of Colo uh, University of Denver. And um, today. Today, he, um, he and I returned from a road trip of about 200 miles. Said, yeah, we were in Rhode Island and then drove down to Brooklyn and then drove here. And we got here today at 1 p.m. in a gigantic truck. And we came here ready to rock yes. with you. So, um, Psychologically, some people think that like trans means transpose, like as in like exist inside of coexist inside of a binary. That just means girl means boy and boy means girl. That's not true at all. It means transcend. It means transcend. It means be so much more than. Like that's the goal. Don't let people trap you in the binary. The binary is a fool's errand. It's ridiculous. It might be one of the great diseases of this century and the century before this century. The forced binary, hot and cold. Nobody wants either of those. People want it to be Goldilocks just right. Doesn't this. Bullshit. It's all bullshit. So trans means transcend. And if you want one of these, you can have one of these. But it won't be dry. <laughs> you have to be careful with them until you get home. <laughs> it's 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 dry. Dry. You just gotta be. Is that okay? Right back. No, no, I just want to go straight up on this and see how it means. Because maybe we get two prints out of every big inking. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah, we get two prints per big inking. Maybe, yeah. That looks good. It looks great. Any other questions? Oh, for the punk stuff. Sorry, 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 sorry. So, so, um, you left off with your knees. I left off with my knees. So that's, that concert was a Bad Brain show in Richmond, Virginia. And I used to live next door to the Bad Brains in DC when I ran away from home. I ran into the arms of the punk rock scene in Washington, DC in the 80s. So um, I, I, I'm like, I am childhood friends with Dave Grohl. It's stupid. It's the stupidest story. I mean, he is, he is like an old childhood friend. Here's what happened. My mom brought me to the Fairfax County Public Schools and they kept on turning us away because they thought that this young black child would just pull their scores down or something. They didn't know I was already fluent in Latin and other shit, you know, like they didn't know I was educated really well. And my mom took me to Bishop Ireton Catholic school and they had their best boy, like give me a tour of the school, guess who their best boy was? Dave Grohl. So, <laughs> so, so he's been a really, really, really nice guy for a really long time. That's a fact. Um, and like, we just grew up in the same scene. We are just friends. We're just buddies, you know, when, um, when I was giving a lecture at the University of Texas, Austin, um, and the waitress kind of freaked out and said like, Foo Fighters are here, oh my God. You know, like we were having a dinner after the lecture and the whole faculty was like taking me out to dinner. I was like, really, Foo Fighters are here right now? So I went and said hi to Dave. 
he came to the table and offered every single faculty member, department chair, dean, whoever was there, offered them tickets to the show he was playing the next night. And it wasn't Foo Fighters. It was then Crooked Vultures, which was the band he put together with John Paul Jones and the cat from Queen's Stone Age. So, and if you were there, you would have laughed your ass off because every single person bar one at the table came up with an excuse like, I would have to get a babysitter. You know, like just he walked around the table like, hey, you want to come to a rock and roll show? My treat. And I was like, oh, never mind. Put me plus four. I'll find some people. And I did. I found four other people to go to the show with. And it was really great fun. My, one of my dear friends, Sandra, was living in Texas at the time. So, but yeah, he's as, he's as, he is as lovely as he seems. And that's just the way he, that's just the way he is. No doubt about it. Don't listen to Courtney Love. She's just pissed. <laughs> okay, what's up? You still, every time I've seen you talk, you still identify yourself as punk. Yeah, punk, punk for grownups is just justice. <laughs> that's it. It's just pursuing justice and not taking shit and telling people that, like, you know, don't eat a shit sandwich because you don't have to and defy authority if you can and if you can afford to. And remember that, like, your labor is the most important thing you have and your humanity towards other people is the most important thing you have. And make sure that women and girls can dance in the revolution and everything will be fine. You know, but yeah, justice is just grown up punk shit. There's not a there's not a punk out there, not the ones in DC anyway, that I that I loved and grew up with. There's not a punk out there that wasn't interested in some form of justice. Because we were driven by these ideas of justice and fairness and equity. And we, you know, it positive force was the reason why. There was an organization that linked up punk shows with uh, activist causes and we all got educated and we all got educated to the AIDS crisis and we all got educated to all the other situations that we were trying to work against you know um, and so yeah punk is just the quest for justice hi do you feel a little bit about um, intentional spaces in Denver you created a really amazing space for oh. people and so I'm curious if there's one that have inspired you in the city or if you're thinking about places elsewhere? Uh, it's an amalgam of all the places elsewhere. All the places elsewhere. Uh, so the reason why bookstore is because I felt that an honest way to make a living is to bring people access to knowledge and information. And because I'm a self-taught person, uh, I really felt that like offering people access to things that they can guide themselves in any direction, as long as it was justice oriented, liberation oriented, art and graphic design, as long as it's just those, you know, you, you can come, you can come in and study with us, be with us, buy books from us or, or borrow books from us. And the borrow thing is a new concept. We're working on a library, which is really great too. Um, the, the so that's the bookstore part um, and i spent a lot of time in great bookstores in new york city um the venue part of it or the space that is per performance oriented like the stage and all that stuff i also as a punk person spent a lot of time in small venues like dc space or 930 club or you know just tiny little venues that meant a lot to the people who were playing and the people who were there and they kind of just it just sticks in their grill you know um, the other reason why we wanted to do a space where community could hang out is because we wanted there to be a safe place to have conversations about queerness or transness or about blackness or whiteness even, you know, um, whatever it is that people want to talk about or want to have a expression about or have an intellectual sort of pursuit in, we want it to be a safe place to be curious about things and being curious in community is a really cool idea. So it feels safer when you're exploring ideas in community. It feels safer when there's a discussion attached to an object or an artifact or a presentation of some kind. So that's that's why um, there are spaces in other parts of the country that I ha continue to look at and be like, oh, that's good. Oh, 
you know, or that's terrible. Ah, you know, that's greenwashed, or that's just fake, or that's garbage, you know, whatever. But there, um, and there have been places in Denver where I've really felt like connected, you know, and there still are places that I feel like I'm connected. It's, uh, here, here's, here's the short version of what I have to say in this. The place that we made is a place where, like, no one's wrong. No one comes there to be wrong. No black people show up to be wrong. No femmes show up to be wrong. No queer people show up to be wrong. They show up to learn, to exchange, to be together. And that's what makes it safe. I don't know what other people's definitions of safe spaces are, but for us, it's like, if you walk in the door to learn and to be in community, then that's good. You know, and who you are isn't bad and what you want to know isn't wrong. Let's just talk it out, you know, so thank you. It is inspired by other places, though, really. And there are other places for sure. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, you can reach out, right? Like I, I manage my own DMs. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Love you. The, the love I speak of is called agape. It's a term that makes love into a choice. Right? It's not something people earn. <laughs> it's a choice in you to be in love. And that to me has become very important that people sense. Because I'm a critical human being, right? Like I have a lot to say. And sometimes I might say things that like might paint a picture of intolerance towards something. But really what I'm doing is I'm fighting for the whole lives of the people who I love, not just my own experience, but the people who I love. And as I fight for those lives, and when I love more people, I love them. And when I love more people, I fight harder for more people. So that's the idea behind this fight or this agape or what's connected, you know. How many of these should I make? Who doesn't want one? Put your hand in the air. I think that's strictly the patient, so. Yeah, so let's keep crying. Sorry, I don't mean to, I don't mean to be like, hey man, what are you doing? Stopping working? Um, I just don't want to work. But I'm happy to answer other things too while we do this, yeah? I will just say this idea of doing letterpress printing is super connected to the typography. I think I can I see. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. It's super connected to the principal graphic design activity that I started with, the stuff on the album covers. Can't see a hand in the air. You can just yell out your question if you have one. When did I start? I think I started printing when I took an unmatriculated college class at the New School for Social Research, or otherwise known as Parsons School of Design. I'm going to spend ten minutes. Um, I took a printmaking class then when I got to New York and I was trying to teach myself graphic design. And I said, well, I should go to uh, take one class. I should go take one class. Um, and so I took two instead. Uh, one was in truth, functional, symbolic logic and introduction to philosophy. And the other one was printmaking. And so I started screen printing in I started screen printing 
while in New York in my early 20s, and then I never gave it up. I, I, gave, I did screen printing for many years, but I also just switched to other forms of printing. <laughs> this is where I'm at. Do you have any questions? My question was like, what inspired you so from everything that I've heard to say, like you're so very inspiring even to yourself as a person. Because I don't think you say anything. Like, do they see you so like like I'm with you? <laughs> it excites me. You do. No, I think that like it's it's not difficult for me to feel uh, inspired by other people because their struggles are so real. Right. And I don't know how to spend the time on time. I don't know. Yeah. See, there's so many people and inspire yourself and bring them along with you. So the, so the, like here's the here's the thesis that I would love to just throw at you, right? Like if you're a hundred thousand dollars in debt by the time you die, is that good or bad? I think that's good as long as you did something good with it, right? Um, no, I just no no it's, it's not it's not the question is just is it good or bad? That's it. That's it. Is it good or bad? I mean, I would if you get a million dollars in debt by the time you die, is that good or bad? It's good. <laughs> no, it doesn't depend on how you spend it. That's the mindset. That's the mindset. Oh, there you go. That's a good one. Let's assume you owe it to massive corporations because they're the only people that could afford to lend that to you. Let's make that small assumption, but I do like that. That's good. That's the dimension I forgot to explore. Depends if someone else has to pay it off. Which, yeah. Yeah, no, no one, no one inherits anyone else's debt and they die. That's not true. Not true? <laughs> no, sure. my, wife's dead. my wife's dead, married to her. I did not inherit her debt. Really? That's great. That's great. Not think wife dead. Yeah. I wondered when you walk back on that little bit. Uh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But, you know, that's a, it's a critical question, right? Like, so if you can't be a hundred thousand dollars in debt or whatever random number in debt by the time you die, then what are you trying to do while you're alive? Are you trying to not be in debt? Uh, now, yeah. Or are you trying to be in the right kind of debt? That's what these five thousand dollars will carry them, right? But in reality, that's I've been learning. Like, money will come and go. It's the so how you spend your life with the memories and enjoying the yeah. right. and, and love, like you said. That's it, right there. Yeah, it's a lubricant, is the way I describe it. Right. It's a super lubricant. Too much of it, shit goes everywhere. That's gross. Right. <laughs> but, but, but yeah. <laughs> um. But the right amount of it helps you do the things that you're going to do anyway. Right. Things you're going to do anyway. It doesn't make you do new things. It just helps you to do the things you're going to do anyway. Which, if you have an instinct that you're going to have kids, money helps you have kids. Money helps you get them to, you know, school, whatever. It's a lot does a lot of things. Press yeah. a means by which to share the message. No, I mean like you would do the people that history crime. Oh yeah. Oh always. Always. Totally. When I give workshops and talk to people about the stuff in the print shop where I'm where I'm working, I tell them that I am the current caretaker of these things. But some of these letters are over 100 years old. I am not. Some of these letters are like, I've got letters that's from 1850. Super old stuff. And it still works, right? It still says, vote, motherfucker. Right? You know, like, I think it ever didn't say that. But you know what I mean? It, it still says those things 
And because I'm the caretaker of these forms, these, these letters, I get to in, I get to instruct them as to what to do. I get to command them into the form that I want them to say. You know, and that's that's a power. Yeah. It's the only kind of power I want. I don't want to be a legislator. I don't want to be in charge of you. You know, not that you're not a lovely person. I, I'd love to command your labor, but but the idea of being in charge of other people is not the kind of power I want. I just want the power to like share what I believe to be true. And I want to be in debt when I die. I want to be completely used up. I want to be a, just a dry husk. <laughs> you know, like I'm good with that. Super good with being just the uh, dehydrated. <laughs> Which is weird because I don't drink enough water as it is. I don't even know where I put my water down. Yeah, have you lost your water? Maybe it's in the bathroom where you know. I think so. So is that helpful? Is that helpful? You know, it's it really is like come on up, or come print something. Come on. I'm trying to get to like 36. Okay, so you're gonna be praying so far. 15 of these things. So far we're at 18. So roll that over there. Flip it. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Flip it. 180. Put it down there. That's great. Okay. Put this where you want it to print on the page. Any way you like. It doesn't matter. Okay. Two hands draw it towards you. Cool. Pick it up. So, yeah. Show it to your adoring crowd. <laughs> well done. And the question is, what does it mean to you? Thanks, boss. We have been traveling together like for the last four days. We have this like super call and response experience in us right now that we're not letting go of. And it also, it also makes us play teammates. Not that we together. Well, you guys have been working together for a while, at least on Thursdays, right? Yeah, on Thursdays, we have a what's called the Fresh Off the Press, which is an opportunity to come visit the print shop. And if we're printing, we're printing. Sometimes we're talking about printing which is not the same thing as printing, but it's close. <laughs> Sometimes we're fixing a printing press. Sometimes we're in print, printing presses around. Sometimes we're casting uh, metal type. I got, a, I got a type casting machine. Um, we, do, we do all sorts of things, but it's really just time in the, print, in the print shop and it gets people closer, a little bit closer to um, what it means to eventually use these things, which, you know, is kind of fun. I don't know. It's like that's a key to be or is it? Right. I'm sorry, I that. I see that's not going to be that person. Oh, just move it, yeah. See, it's stiff. It's stiff, yeah. I don't think that's a no, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking a lighter to um, ink if you if you feel like you have to to get it the right temperature. Sometimes the cold is the thing that makes it stiff, and then sometimes it's the uh, chemistry that makes it stiff. You know, just depends. Okay, I'm going to see this because you just watching print huge type of fast thing. Have you been down yet? Are you talking about Manco's press? Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, that's all right. It's a little down. And then, um, actually, no. Sorry. Different. different. Totally different. Yeah. I was like, wait, that's the same house. So watching down here, so like that, it's like the oldest press in the country. That's, it's like 120, but it's like the family's running for four generations. You may have to feel this newspaper. Uh, the actual machine that they are typing on, um, I you say typing? <laughs> you say typing? 
typing? Um, yeah, I could like say it. He's putting the letters in. Yeah, yeah. And then. By hand type. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's the oldest line type in the US? Uh, in the world, I think. Easy. I, I mean, you. Possible. Fact check me, but yeah, there's two. America is a really young country. Just so you get clear about that. <laughs> the oldest of a kind of film that was made in America? Sure, totally possible. Totally possible, but it's not the oldest of a thing, it's the oldest of a branded thing, like a thing that was made in America. But yes, of course. Yeah, I'm like, I remember I converted this place to the guy. It's like, doesn't have a phone, what will they take cash? It's like this. Cash for what? What's he making? For the newspaper. It's the daily newspaper. It's, 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 that's what I was getting at. It's the oldest daily newspaper in America. That's what it is. And, and it's yeah. a trip. I definitely have a very cool thing. thing. I am familiar with that. Is this what was his name? Um, Sam. Sam something. I send him. I did send him twenty dollars, so I do get it every every week. But um, but my question was around this etiquette piece of how do you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. There's tons of different kinds of typeface. There's tons of different kinds of engagement in the press. And so, is there anything that's like? You do this. I'm good. Yes. Yes. Anybody who wants to come to this, we can bring this. This is your time. So. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead and ink it once or twice. It gets me on there. But you're welcome to pop up too. Wherever you like it. We'll bring it towards you. Oh, we'll a little bit more gusto than that. Uh, I'm also just yeah, a little bit more than that. Take a look at that. All those little micro moves, you will all come out. That's your that's Thank you. Woo. Yeah, you can see the little squish as I move the paper. It's cool. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm familiar with those guys, and it's cool. It's very cool. Come on. Don't stress. Just go on this side. Go on this side. Just go check this way. Yeah. Roller side down. No, it's safe, yeah. Did I answer all your questions? <laughs> Don't text me about the work. Isn't that silly? Strange. Show your question. What's up? The first thing that is I was going to explain the two aphorisms that we chose to feature back there. So perfect. Remember where you put it. Um, so the constructs, which is we can accept the construct and all of it says so we can be decide where it is false, be right or invent a part of ourselves, put, it, put, our, put ourselves in it and be free is, is something that I wrote a while ago that is largely engaged with the idea of like knowing like where you are and what you can do with where you are, knowing what's going on and how you can affect what is going on, where you put your body, where you put yourself, where you put your life, your love, you know. And the idea of doing it for the purpose of being free, that's just Thursday. That's just Thursday. We do everything to be free. The point of this exercise is to consider yourself either accepting the construct or reinventing some part of it. Not all of it, a small part of it. Right? I'm not making a demand, I'm making a suggestion that this is the way that you can engage in your work. If you want to be free, this is a great way to try. Is that? Oh, yeah, for sure. But I mean, the larger body of work, you know, like this is today's work. So, yeah, yeah, it's all part of a larger body. 
<laughs> the um, The word work has become problematic for some people. The concept of labor has become something that people want to talk about. They want to talk about labor and work as kind of interchangeable concepts. I don't I don't think I understand how people are using the word work. And using the word labor right now. I'm just going to accept that. I don't think I understand it. I understand part of what they're saying. I said to somebody, What's your dream job? And they say to me, I don't dream of my labor. <laughs> like, wow. I just learned something. You know, like, like well, I need to hold on to something. So good. But I don't understand. Because I can But I do think that there is any difference between a job and work. Like work is based in yourself. It's a part of I mean, I'm all about you working on some definitions of that stuff. I still don't understand. <laughs> It's okay for me not to understand something. I have a lot of answers because I don't have one or two of them. Okay. You know, like I'll work on it. I'll think on it. I'll see if they show up. How are we at? Thank you. <laughs> yes, boss. Um, so, but, but the reason why I don't understand what's going on in this conversation about labor is because I am really I'm deeply connected to it, and I'm also operating from an immigrant mindset, and I'm also born from immigrants, and I also just work every day. And it's this, not entirely by itself, but this goes a long way of explaining, like, my mode. You know why I decided to love what I did because I do it every day. Um, so when people talk about that, I'm sensing that there is also a kind of, like you say, a disconnect between the concept of the job and the work. You know, like generally speaking, it's what makes other people rich. So generally speaking. Don't work for the antitrust work. Right? So I can make dots pretty quick in that, but I still don't understand what you mean. Because I see you coming up. Do it from this side, that's your brayer at one time. Great job. Rock that anywhere you'd like to be behind. Good side of things. Sign and date it? I don't sign and date shit for free. <laughs> Make it for free. <laughs> they say this. But you've also really found a way to make your work with your love and your life one thing. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah, eventually. Okay. You know, it's like a it's fucking epic. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> claiming, claiming. Um, yeah, I mean, it comes from being encouraged towards it, of course, by people who 
blockchain. And that also comes from getting clear, getting super clear about stuff. Like I had, I had to, um, I had to talk to somebody. Uh, somebody was asking me about Palestine, and it's, they had felt that like some people were uh, behaving in an anti-Semitic way, and um, and they wanted me to like talk about it. Because we do that. Because I'm Jew. I'm not really Jew, right? And, uh, and, I, and I was like, you know, first of all, I have to admit this. When I look back on these instances where people send me emails and ask me things that are really, really important, this is where I'm in touch with the concept of me. This is where I go. Then I think that there's an opportunity. Because if I, I don't know about you guys, but when you are in your truth, to you just feel a little bit stronger, like you could do other stuff, like the stuff you have to do anyway, you know, like whatever. Like you feel like you're in your purpose when you stay here. So to me, there's a sideways. Um, so there's a so there's an energy that comes from speaking my truth that I did basically dipped into right or wrong and gave a person an answer. Want to hear the answer? You want to hear it? Yeah. This is not the position of the University of <laughs> Metro State University. Uh, yeah. It's not. It's not their position. But here, here it is. This is there. This is it's fine. Can't have it unless one pay for it. Goes a little something like this. Thanks for asking such an important question. These can be difficult times. I'm fine. And that My reality is not the knowledge of Jewish component to this occupation. It is a colonial project of a far right government that runs Israel. It is a genocide project of a far right government that runs Israel. And finally, it has been an apartheid project in the hands of a far right coalition party called the Kud, nationalist anti-queer, anti-black, anti-Arab conservatives who happen to run Israel. Jewish involvement here is circumstantial. Jews all over the world reject the actions of Netanyahu and Likud. Myself and other Jewish people are trapped by nationalism, the conflation of the Jewish and Israeli identity. She asked me if the, uh, the state of Israel should exist or date. Jewish people will probably do better in the world with a place. However, revenge, apartheid, genocide, and cruelty are not Jewish values. If this is what the Jewish state is doing, many of us cannot belong to it. We will only do better when we are in communities and less isolated. Never again is not a Hebrew birthright. It is a call for justice everywhere for all people to speak out there is oppression and the potential for genocide. So, I stand with Palestinian people and all people who are seeking liberation from oppression and offer no criticism for the form that that liberation should take. I'm compelled to mention I bring no criticism or disgust or terror for the loss of life which is evoked during the escape of Jewish people from bondage in Egypt which we celebrate why others in the world still suffer. Now, for any Jew in the room, we're talking about Passover, talking about the murdering of the firstborn child of Egypt in order to force Pharaoh's hand to create freedom for Jewish people. So people must be free. The cost of a life is always a currency. In slavery, 
Yes, I didn't murder. For me, my intersectional identity gives me clarity. My blackness makes for it visions of Emmett Till or Malcolm X. For the millions of black lives before mine that still fight for acknowledgement and freedom of profession. Other people expressing themselves does not upset me. Neither does the listening of my Jewish family and friends who have forgotten truths that they used to hold so dear because of their rage. Posting other people's videos isn't my thing. My views are not borrowed. They are hard earned and hard thought. I asked, what is the thing after rage? And by thing, I mean feeling or responsibility. I don't expect you to agree, but also, though I can engage, I'm not looking for clarity, debate, or discussion. I am clear about that. I'm also willing to take consequences for that if it doesn't suit you. We done. No, we need formal shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at least one more question. Hi. Use it. Good question. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So um, if you're wondering which tracks I use. Yeah, so the first track is Roots Maneuver. He's a West Indian, British, West Indian cat. Super fun, super fun. Everything he does is amazing. So just go for Roots Maneuver. Um, the second track was Stereo Lab from Dots and Loops. And I believe that Track is called Brackage after Stan Brackage, the famous Colorado experimental filmmaker. Third track. That's really cheesy. Um, you have to share with me. Well, yeah, he's got a lot of like a marble surface. Oh, it's not like, yeah, it's not like firm and you know, knows everything. And it's, 100% right. It's negotiating with the sea. It's swimming. Um, yes. uh, is it okay if you just do these two steps? Okay, cool. Put it where you want. Come on. So yeah, and then the last track, I, did I already say the last track? No, the last track is Ardo Lindsay. And he's the former guitarist for a band called The Lounge Lizards, but also he had a punk band before that in New York called, was it DOA? No, D, DNA, DNA, super noisy, just oh, super reckless, fantastic noise band in New York in, this, in the 80s. In the late 80s, early 90s. Do what feels good. Aya? Ayo. Uh, my, my niece's name is Aya, but it's close. Thank you. Could be the last one. Does anybody want to know anything else? I'm an open book for real. I I don't worry about it. You know why I'm an open book? So it's, uh, it's to know more about how you from uh, to medium to we're seeing you uh, making sculpture with your other project. We got to saw see some video of it. Just what that journey was like. So, sure. I mean, I am not working. I haven't. When I was figuring out what graphic design is, isn't whatever. When I was figuring that out, I realized that we were living. Thank you. I, I realized that we were living amongst what I call formats of language. 
kind of like the way that we experience formats of water. Ice cubes, apps, tears, moisture, condensation, all these formats of water. And they all seem to have a purpose or a role or a way of being in the world, right? Our physical world experiences water in so many ways. Puddles, right? We're just stomping it, right? Rain, right? So, so when I thought about type, and, when I, and I still think about type this way, I just go, if I know what I'm trying to say, which is a labor of writing, right? Then the format that that takes is undetermined until I like find it or understand it better. So today I'm printing this like this. But that's the third or fourth time that I presented the construct. And now it looks like that. Intentionally, like it was found. Intentionally, like, what is this? Where did it come from? Right? Formats of language is for me like just the undifferentiated aspect of the execution of the idea. Ideas don't have an execution attached to them. Writing doesn't have an execution attached to them. But if you decide to be an artist or designer, right, you end up saying, oh, I'm going to make that into a thing. And so we make it into things. And so we have all these formats. And sometimes 3D is the format. Sometimes a gigantic cardboard cutout letter sculpture piece is the answer. So I don't know any more than uh, you do in the sense of I don't know what something's going to be before I make it something. But I'm always looking for tools or the ways of making things, you know, and I'm lo looking for opportunities for people to fund my tools. So I bought a laser, right? Like I bought a big ass laser and that's what cut all that cardboard for the cardboard sculpture stuff. And, you know, and I own printing presses because people ask me to do stuff. So, so, and the reason why I, I own my own tools is because, um, just like we were trying to talk about with the work thing and the job thing, like people are, people are not always trustworthy. So if you make your work with your own steam, if you make your work with your own energy and you make your tools, you know, like if you create a, a self-sufficient culture around you where everybody can participate in this stuff and there's no, like, I'm not saying that rent doesn't have to be paid, but not on this. On this, maybe, but not on this, you know? So I can just take this under the bridge. <laughs> I can't explain it, you know? Like, I can just do my thing still. So, so I, I think a lot about it from that perspective. I don't think that, um, I don't think that vulnerable people should be more vulnerable because they don't own their tools. And while, I'm, while I count myself in the vulnerable people area, it's simply because of the place I live and the policy that is written against me, not because I feel vulnerable, but because I am legislatively vulnerable. And so therefore that's the way I, I identify in that sense with many other people in the room, you know, uh, women without reproductive access, you know, re reproductive rights and access to healthcare, you know, things, things like that, you know, like going to another state and then realizing that like your rights just changed as a person, you know, like in this country. So. So I don't identify as a as an injured person or or as a vulnerable person at home, but but legislatively, you know, yeah, sure, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Let's call it a wrap. Should we call it a wrap? Because everything else could be done through DMs. I promise. <laughs> Just DM me, and we can talk some more. <laughs>